Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for coming out. Very happy to have all of you here. Um, I'm Peter Abiel, professor here at Berkeley. I also work at OpenAI and also uh, work at a startup called GreatScope. Um, today, um, I'll give you the first lecture, but let me first introduce you to the entire uh, organizational and teaching staff here. So we have four organizers, myself, Rocky Duan, Peter Chen, Andre Garpathy. We're very lucky to have uh, five guest instructors who are joining us, Chelsea Finn, Vladimir Mni, um, John Schulman, Sergey Levin, four actually. Um, then we have, I believe, um, 19 TAs um, who will come in largely in the afternoon to help out with the lab sessions. All right, let's get started. So what's a market decision process? In the market decision process, there's an agent. The agent gets to choose an action at time T, action AT. As a consequence, the environment changes. Your environment is the world around the agent, which could include the body of the robot. The agent is just the brain. So if it's a robot, agent is the brain. The robot itself, the physical thing, as well as the, envir the environment around the robot, we'll call environment. The environment is in some state. After the action, state will change. We'll hit state ST plus one. A reward might be emitted, associated with what just happened, and then this process repeats. So the way this completely distinguishes itself from supervised learning is that there's this feedback cycle in that the next action you take, the next decision you make, is in a situation that's the consequence of what you did before as opposed to all one-off decisions. One reason you might be excited about learning about this is the many success stories that exist in deep reinforcement learning, for example, and even regular reinforcement learning. 2004, uh, Peter Stone's group got, um, in RoboCup soccer, these robots to play really, really well by using reinforcement learning to train them to walk faster than the other robots they were playing against. And that's really good if you play soccer. Andrew Ring's group at Stanford, which I was part of back then, um, got a helicopter to hover upside down. Um, Russ Tedrick, during his PhD work at MIT, got this two-legged robot to learn to walk with reinforcement learning. Um, James Cobra and Jan Peters got this robot to swing up a ball and catch it in a cup. Um, and then the bottom row are the more recent results, where the top row takes in typically state, so a low-dimensional representation and maps from low-dimensional designed representation that you work with to actions. The lower row takes in raw observations, for example, pixels in Labyrinth or pixels from Atari. Um, this uh, Majoka environments take in all the joint angles, joint velocities, medium high dimensional. Um, we'll see a lot of those examples. Then the PR2 robot there learns to place the block into the matching opening from raw pixels to torques at each of the motors. And then, of course, there's AlphaGo, um, which took um, a picture, which is a picture of the board and then process that to try to make decisions about how to play Go, and it's actually better than best human players. So how do we solve these kinds of problems? There's a pretty big landscape in reinforcement. It's not just one method that people use, and we'll try to cover all of that. And what we're starting out with right now, we'll look at policy iteration and value iteration, and we'll build up from there. So let's formalize this for a bit and make sure we all have the same notation in mind. A MDP, market decision process, um, is defined by a set of states capital S. For example, um, for a Majoko simulated robot, it could be state is a vector with joint angles, joint velocity, and coordinates and velocity of the center of mass of the robot. Set of actions, for example, the torques going to each of the motors. There's a transition function that says, what's the distribution? This doesn't need to be deterministic. It's often stochastic. Distribution over next states S prime, given current state and action. There's a reward function that says, if you're in a state S, took action A, and landed in state S prime, how much reward do you get for that? You start in some state S0, or it might be an initial state distribution. Um, for now, we'll have a start state. A discount factor gamma, which says that you care, how much you care about the future compared to the current time. Um, simple way to think of it is, imagine reward was money. It doesn't have to be money, of course. Then you'd rather have money today than a year from now, because if you had it now, you could earn interest on it. And so you'd have more money a year from now automatically. Um, discount factor gamma kind of corresponds to that. that. You care more about reward you get now than the reward you get later. The horizon is how long you're going to be acting. Sometimes it's infinity. Often it's shorter than that. OK, let's make this concrete with a running example for this lecture. Here's a simple grid world. We have our agent over here. 
Our agent can move north, east, south, or west. Um, those are the actions. If there is a boundary, it'll just stay in place rather than move outside of the, the, the maze. There are some special states. Um, this one here, the diamond plus one. If you go there and then take the special exit action, you get a reward of plus one and it's over. Um, if you go to this state here, only one thing is available, the exit action, you get a reward of negative one. Everything else has zero reward. So clearly what you want to do is you want to somehow navigate to the plus one stage and exit from there. That's we're going to maximize your reward. And if there's discounting, the sooner the better. Um, so the objective would be maximize expected sum of rewards under a policy pi. What's a policy pi? Policy pi is a prescription for each state what action you want to take. It could be a distribution over actions. For this lecture right here, we'll mostly work with deterministic policies, where for each state, you deterministically will choose an action in our policies that we talk about. What, we what you see here is just one possible policy. This could be a pretty reasonable one, by the way. It might even be the optimal one um, in terms of collecting rewards. Transitions do not have to be deterministic, and so We'll, we'll highlight what we assume, but often, and that's for this particular grid world here, often we'll work with the assumption that if you choose an action, for example, north, there's an 80% chance you actually move north, a 10% chance you move off to the left, 10% chance you move off to the right. Question there? Yeah. Yeah, so when I say deterministic policy, that is a policy that is a deterministic mapping from state to action. And a stochastic policy will map from state to distribution over actions. Question there. Uh, I was wondering for the distribution of action, sometimes I see here there's a, a slight difference in first effect, and there's a finite scale, yeah, finite scale. I was wondering if you could answer that. So the question was, um, sometimes people define MDP explicitly saying finite set of states, finite set of actions. Um, Often that simplifies getting guarantees. Um, for the guarantees that will show, it's probably needed to assume it's finite, but in general the algorithms can be applied even when it's infinite. Um, so I didn't want to put too much emphasis on it here. Um, but usually it's from a theoretical point of view to make guarantees easier to get. So, the problem of optimal control or planning is given an MDP, spit out a policy that's the optimal policy, the, one, the policy that maximizes expected reward. We'll see two exact methods to do this, value iteration and policy iteration. For now, we'll assume small discrete state action spaces so that we can get the concepts across. But keep in mind, this is building up to large state action spaces, possibly infinitely many states and actions available. Once it's continuous, it is going to be infinite. Um, it's just a way to get the intuition across for now. So value iteration centers around this concept called a optimal value function, which we'll denote by V star. V star is, the V star of S is how much expected discounted reward you can get from state S if you use the best possible policy. So what you see here is expected reward from state S, assuming we use a policy pi, and we have a max here over all policies pi, and that's what defines the optimal value function. I'm not saying that's how you're gonna find it, because if you wanna find it that way, there's a lot of policies to choose from, and you don't wanna try every possible policy and then see which one maximizes this, but that is what the optimal value function is. Okay, let's build some intuition for this. So for this maze here, um, let's think about what the optimal values are. And for now, let's make a few assumptions. We'll assume that the actions are deterministically successful. So whenever you go in a certain direction, you want to go there, you get there. Okay, what's the optimal value V star for square 4, 3, which is this one over here? Okay, give you a moment to think about this. What would it be from that square? All you can do is take the finish action, which will give you a reward of one. So that gives you an optimal value of one. How about the next one? Four, three, three, which is this one over here. Also one, because no discounting, and the horizon is 100, so you have plenty of time to get to that uh, exit state. 
How about the next one here, two, three? Also one, 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 also one. How about four, two? This one here, only exception, that one is negative one. So for a deterministic MDP and um, this kind of simple grid world, pretty easy to find the optimal values just by looking at it. Let's change it a little bit. What if there's discounting? Gamma equals 0 0.9. What is now this value here? V star 4 comma 3, which is the top one. Still one. How about the one next to it? 3, 3. 0.9. 1 over. We need to do a multiplication. 5 over. We need to multiply that 5 times. And still the 4, 2 square will have negative 1 because that's just all that can happen to you there. How about if now we make things stochastic? Um, with probability 0 0.8, you get what you want, but 0 0.1, you move off to the left, 0 0.1, you move off to the right. 4, 3? Oh, question first. Yes. So the discount factor has a few justifications. One is that you care less about rewards in the future. So if it was actually money, you might say, I can earn interest at this rate. You can do, then do a calculation what your discount factor should be. Um, to correspond to that if all you do is collect money, let's say. Um, another reason to do it is that a lot of algorithms, um, thanks to the discount factor, will converge. And without the discount factor, it might be possible to collect infinite reward. Not in this case, because once you get a reward, you actually exit. But if you had a place where you could get reward by just being in a state and stay in that state, things would become infinite. But with the discount factor, things will be bounded, easier to work with. Um, Another reason you'll see the discount factor a lot is to actually just do variance reduction. You might actually care about no discount factor scenario, but by using the discount factor, you attenuate further down the line effects. And if you have an approximate computation you're doing, that attenuation can reduce variance and actually give you a better result than without the attenuation if you only have finite amount of computation that you're doing. So how do you decide what discount factor to use? Essentially, you think about the horizon often. You say, if my horizon is 100, you might want to use actually 0.99 instead of 0.9, but that's harder to compute with by hand, so I picked 0.9 here. Um, so, yeah, you just gauge kind of how long does it take. Let's say you build a walking robot. Um, how long is a walking cycle? It's not, if you want your robot to walk for an hour, you don't need a discount factor that corresponds to an hour long. You need to know how long is one step or two steps. You understand the length of the gate. Have your discount factor correspond to the fact that we'd go through a full cycle or maybe two cycles. And at that point, you should be good to go uh, to train that one. And it, you can then keep reusing that policy for much longer than you actually have with your discount factor. Question there. Um, we'll get to that later, to, to the formal guarantees. But very good question. It can be either, usually it's deterministic, but in principle it could be stochastic. Right. Question there. Uh, why, why is the one minus one of the Great question. So why on minus one can't we just move up? That's exactly why, why I want to work in detail through this example, is to clarify the dynamics of this grid world. So the dynamics here is such that once you're in the minus one square or the plus one square, you don't have move actions available to you anymore. Those are not there. All you can do is take the exit action. It's your only option. You have no choices among actions. It's the one action available is the one you take, and you exit with a minus one in one of them and then with a plus one in the other one. Question? Sure. Um, just to make sure when we're doing these calculations, we're not worried about can the agent get to the target or not? Like, because this grid is only, the largest distance is much less than 100, so you can just eyeball that you have nothing to worry about with the horizon. I could have made it infinity, but then we'd have to be more, maybe some people would worry about how infinity, what now? So I just picked something large. We'll formalize what you're asking about a little later. Um, yes. It's a bit of an art and you might have to play around with it, but let's say you think it takes 100 time steps to get the behavior that you want, for example, a walking gait, then you might take gamma equals 0 0.99 or maybe 0 0.995 or something to have a little bit of margin. Um, and essentially what you're doing is you pick your horizon as short as possible 
so that the computation is better conditioned in many ways while still looking far enough forward that you can capture the effects of long-term rewards, whatever long-term means in your specific scenario. Yes? So for really big state spaces, I'll defer that till we get to really big state spaces. Yes. If you start at 4, 3, yeah. the game will be over in the next step as you take the exit action. Yeah. So, oh, so this, this is not stepping chronologically through where the agents will be. This is just looking at the optimal value function has this definition over here. And if we're wondering what is the optimal value of being in state 4, 3, it happens to be 1. What is the optimal value of being in state 3, 3? It's 0 0.9 because you would take one time step to get to the state with the plus one, and then you'd exit, which would give you the plus one, but it would be discounted by 0 0.9 because it was one time step later. And so that's how, how we're working through this. Um, just starting from scratch for each, each line here, not building up um, line by line. Oh, another one, yes. So, so, so here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, let's defer discussion of the discount factor and any further questions on the discount factor, except if you don't know what the definition is. The definition is essentially what we saw on the slide without the typo, which is here, is that it determines how much later rewards count. So let's assume this is given to us, and the design choice of what you're going to choose as your discount factor will defer till, till later. It's always a scalar, yeah. Correct? Yeah, so, so what this means, condition on the policy pi, and so you're conditioning on the policy pi, this action will be what this policy prescribes for state ST. That's what this means. I see, you're saying that in principle you could reverse the mapping maybe, yeah. Still better to fix the typo, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have to be one-to-one -one either, so it's not always gonna work. Um, Mm-hmm. If you're at the two, three state um, and you're deterministic, the optimal policy will say move up and you'll be guaranteed to move up. Then the optimal policy will say move to the right. You'll move to the right. And I've taken two time steps and then you can take your exit to get the reward. So 0 0.9 times 0 0.9 times the reward of one. Um, but you're getting at something we'll get on, on the next slide. So now, I'm, I'm gonna move forward a bit, otherwise we might only do questions for the first hour um, and defer questions for, for a little later. Um, so, I, th I think I'm really gonna defer questions. <laughs> we'll, we'll be around. But I think also a lot of the questions will be clarified as you've seen more context. Because right now you've seen 10 slides and you have questions. Once you've seen 1,000 slides, a lot of things will be a lot clearer. So, now, let's change our assumption. Now the action is not always successful. Only 80% chance success. 10% chance you go to the left, 10% chance to the right of where you want it to go. 
For the 4-3 state, it's still going to be value of 1, because the best thing you can do from there is exit is the only option. Um, how about from the 3-3 state? Well, the best thing you can do is move right and then exit, but the move right might not succeed. Assuming the move right succeeds, that's a probability of 0 0.8, then you exit, that gives you 0 0.8 times discount 0 0.9 times 1 the reward. If it didn't succeed, you might have moved, you might have stayed in place, because you veered off to the left, but to the left means bouncing off the wall and you stay where you are, and that would give you 0 0.1 chance of that, discount factor 0 0.9 times then the value of where you land up, end up, 3, 3, and if you move dash it to the right, you land in a 3, 2 state, um, and you have this contribution there. What you see now is that the value of the state 3, 3 is defined as a function of the value of the other states. There is a recursive aspect to the definition here. And so this makes it tricky. We can't just put a number on this. We need to consider them all at the same time to get somewhere. And that's exactly what value iteration is going to do for us. I'm going to defer a few questions for now. I'm going Um, yeah, the this, this slides, the, the non-draft slides will have the answers. Yeah. So in value iteration, what you do is let's build this all up together for all states. When there's zero time steps left, so V star zero means the optimal value of a state when you have zero time steps left. Nothing can happen anymore, that's just zero. Um, that's very simple. When there's one time step left, that's V1 star of S. We can write it out as follows. It's, you look at all possible actions in that state. For each action, you check what would happen. Well, distribution over next states will happen. I get a reward for that. That immediate transition plus a discount factor times the value of the next state where there will be only zero time steps left. Okay, so this is a recursive decision. My optimal value with one step to go is immediate reward plus value with zero steps to go in that next state. We can repeat this. Optimal value for two time steps to go can be written as recursively immediate reward plus value for one time step to go. And again, looking at the math, you will see a lot of this notation. We maximize over all possible actions available to us. See what happens for that action will be a distribution over possible things that happen. And for each thing that happens, what's the reward, and what's the future value you get from there, but with one less time step to go from that next state as prime. And keep doing this for any arbitrary k, the optimal value for state uh, s, when, with it, when the horizon is h equal k, is max overall actions in s, sum over s prime, next states, probability landing in s prime, reward that you get on the transition, plus discount factor times value with k minus one steps to go. This is a full algorithm. Keep in mind that what we have on the left here depends on things on the right that are one time step shorter, but can depend on other states. It's not just value of one state, depends on just itself, it depends on potentially all the other states' values for one time step less in the horizon. So here's our full value iteration algorithm. We start with initializing values equal to zero, that's for zero time steps to go. Then we iterate for k from 1 through h. k will be how many time steps to go. Then we look at all states, so it's a double loop, and we can compute the value for that state that we currently look at with k time steps to go with the equation we saw on the previous slide. And we can also compute the policy, the optimal policy for k time steps to go from that state, which is the argmax of the same equation. So it's good to stare at this carefully because this equation in many ways is the core of pretty much any lecture we're gonna be, gonna be giving here and become familiar with the notation for values, transition model, reward, um, states, actions, and so forth. The equation for the value function is called the value update or Bellman update or Bellman backup. You might hear us use any of those terms for this. Um, that's the value equation that you see there. Okay, let's look at an example in action of how this plays out for our grid world. So this is our grid world, and then in the middle here, it's a, a little more uh, simplified picture, but it's the same uh, setup with two exit squares with a reward of plus one, negative one, and so forth. And what we're showing on each square is the optimal value 
in this case, for zero time steps to go. And we know that's going to be zero everywhere. We have a noise of 0 0.2, meaning 80% chance success when we choose an action, 20% chance that we either veer to the left or the right, discount of 0 0.9. This is the equation we're going to use to get the value for one time step to go. You can think about what is this going to be? V1 star, if you only have one time step to go, means that only on the squares where you can exit will something happen, and it'll be a plus one or a negative one depending on which of the squares you're on. Keep in mind, only the exit action is available there. You cannot move away from those squares. That's why once you're in the negative one square, you're going to get negative one. You can't just jump out of it. It's not available. Two time steps to go. What would, get, what would we expect? We would expect that we start getting non-zero values at squares that neighbor the non-zero squares. Because there is value with one time step to go in those squares. So then if you're neighbor to that and you have two time steps to go, you could get a non-zero value. Here's what we have for two time steps to go. Note that not all neighboring squares get a value. Um, what's happening? The 0 0.72 is, well, there's 80% chance that you land in that state that you want, and 0.9 discount factor, that's 0.72. If you move sideways, you end up with zero rewards within a horizon of two. The one next to the pit, um, why is that a zero? Because the optimal action is to actually move left, move into that wall, which bounces you off the wall, you stay where you are, 80% chance, 10% chance you move down, 10% chance, 10 chance you move up, and 0% chance you move into the pit. So it turns out from that spot, it's better to move into the wall than to move up to be safer. Once there's more time steps to go, it'll depend on the discount factor. Because once you have many time steps, you might decide to move up, take the risk, because you can make it all the way into the positive reward. But right now, there's not enough time to make it to the positive reward. So you should just stay safe, bump into the wall, and stay where you are. Three time steps to go. Turns out with three time steps, the optimal action in that middle square is to try to move up. It might succeed to get all the way to the plus one. But they might also get the negative one if it's unlucky. That's why it's only 0.43 there. And the other one is 0.52, which is higher because you would never end up in the pit uh, from there. And so you see how this kind of fans out from where the rewards are to other states where you get non-zero values as the horizon becomes longer and longer and longer. And what also happens is at some point, this actually starts remaining the same. The values don't change anymore. Somehow this converged. Why would that be? Well, if once, you, once you have enough time to essentially be guaranteed to get into the positive reward, having more time is not going to help you, and so the values will stop changing. They will not actually stop changing if you looked at the real numbers, but if you look at finite precision, they will stop changing. Um, if you look at the real numbers, they won't stop changing. There's always a small chance that your action always fails, and if you had one more step in your horizon, then you had a slightly higher chance to, to succeed. Now, there's a theorem for this. Value iteration converges for if you have a discount factor in a finite state action space. At convergence, we have found the optimal value function V star for the discounted infinite horizon problem, which satisfies the Bellman equations. So at convergence, this equation will be satisfied. And so what we see here is that value iteration is a way to solve this equation in an efficient way. So once we do this and once it's converged, we actually know how to act. Because the optimal policy for the infinite horizon problem against what, this specific discount factor that we worked with will be the argmax of that equation over there, which we anyway were already computing when we were doing this uh, value iteration updates. An interesting observation here is that the infinite horizon policy is stationary. That for a given state, when the horizon is infinite, if it's time zero or time one or time two, it's always the same thing that's optimal to do. This makes sense because from that time onwards, it's infinite. It doesn't really matter what time it is if it's infinite, infinite time in front of you. And so we just need one policy pi star that says for each state what to do for the infinite horizon setting. Let's give some intuition behind the convergence. Don't want to dwell on this too long, but I want to include it um, so you at least get some notion of why this might be the case. As we're running through value iteration, 
We've computed V0 star, V1 star, V2 star. At some point, we have computed VH star of S for horizon H. That is, expect the sum of rewards you get when acting optimally from state S for H steps. What additional reward do we collect from then onwards after H steps? Well, we don't know what it's going to be just by, by if we don't know the MDP, but if it's a maximum reward you could possibly get, then we can bound how much you can get from then onwards. It's gamma to the H plus one, because that's how much it's worth, things you get at that time, times the reward you get at time H plus one, plus gamma to the H plus two, reward you get at time H plus two, and so forth. This is a geometric series, and you can bound this by this quantity over here. Gamma to the h plus 1 over 1 minus gamma times r max. So what is this saying? It's saying that if you act optimally for the first h time steps, which is what v, v h star is telling you, and you, then the best you can hope for after that is to add this much value. Well, what is this? How much value can you possibly add after the H time steps? If H is pretty large, this is gonna be pretty small because one minus gamma is, going to, is a constant, R max is a constant, and gamma to the H plus one will become very small as H becomes large. And so we see that for very large H, whatever you can get after that horizon is gonna be negligible, and as H goes to infinity, it's gonna be zero. And so what that means is that you get convergence um, of V star H as H goes to infinity to V star, which is the optimal value for infinite horizon. This argument assumes that all rewards are positive. You can do something similar using absolute va max absolute value of rewards um, if you have negative rewards. Same kind of uh, reasoning will hold through. Okay. Don't worry too much about the theory, you're not gonna need this, but I also wanted to make sure that you know there exists some theory behind this. There's even more theory behind this that, again, you're not gonna need, but I wanna make sure you know about the terminology. There's something called contractions. Effectively, what they say is that if you do an update to your value function from k to k plus one, um, then that somehow will contract. So no matter how you initialize things, things get pulled together and get pulled onto V star. Don't worry about the theory there. But if you want to do something more advanced at some point, you want to look up contractions and maybe prove something about your algorithm. Okay, now let's think about the effects of discount factor and noise and do a little exercise. So here's another maze. The bottom row has rewards of negative 10. Same kind of system. Wherever you see a reward marked on a square, your only option is to exit from there and take what's written on there. You cannot move away from anything that's marked with a number here. So once you hit the bottom pits, that's it, negative 10. There's a plus 10 at the end. There's a one in the middle there. There's some gray squares that are walls. You start in the, in the yellow square, and the challenge for you here is to match things up. Here's what I want you to think about. You, what if we want our optimal policy to prefer the close exit, the plus one exit, and be willing to risk the cliff while doing so? So we want a policy that goes along the bottom, shortest path to the one. What if we want the optimal policy to be the one that prefers the close exit but avoids the cliff, so it goes along the top to the close exit? What if you want the distant exit, the plus 10, but we're happy to risk the cliff? And what if we want the distant exit, but we should avoid the cliff? Those are four different optimal policies you could imagine. Because there are two good exit states you could shoot for. Some, one of them is closed, the other one further away. It could be risk averse or not worry about the risk. The question for you is, which one should you choose as the definition of your MDP to get those optimal behaviors? So for gamma equals 0 0.1, noise equals 0 0.5, what will the optimal policy be among those four? And so forth. So there's a matching you're supposed to do, and I'll give you a couple minutes to talk to each other and try to figure out if you want behavior A, do you need MDP 1, 2, 3, or 4 for behavior A to be optimal? If you want behavior B, do you need MDP 1, 2, 3, or 4 for behavior B to be optimal? And so forth. So yeah, take a couple minutes, think about it, talk to your neighbor, and see what you come up with. Okay, so to get policy A, policy A, who thinks we need one? Raise of hands. 
Okay, a few people think one. To get policy A, who thinks we need two? A few people, who thinks we need three? A few people, who thinks we need four? Okay, let's see. Majority was right. Um, so, prefer to close exit, risking the cliff. If you have a discount factor close to zero, you don't care much about the future. You need to get your reward as soon as possible because it's worthless if you get it much later. And so you need that shortest path to get something that's still valuable to you, even if it means risking the cliff. How about for B? B was prefer the close exit, but avoiding the cliff. Who thinks one? A lot of people. Who thinks two? Who thinks three? Who thinks four? Four is not coming back. Um, <laughs> all right, so let's see. If, number one, yes. Um, what happened here is discount factor close to zero, um, but there's a lot of noise. So if you were to go close to the cliff, you'd likely drop off. Uh, so you need to take, it, take the safe path along the top to have a chance to even get to that reward. Next one, C was preferred a distant exit, but you're willing to risk the cliff. Well, we already had one and four, you know it's not coming back. So who thinks two? Wow, okay. Who thinks three? Let's see. Everybody was right. Um, what do we have here? Discount factor close to one, which means you care a lot about the distant future. So you're willing to go far. Noise equals zero means that it's not a real risk to risk the cliff. It's, it's not a risk at all. You, you can go there and make it to the reward of plus 10, no problem. And so then the last one, of course, is three. Okay, let's switch gears for a moment and terminology, Q values. A Q value is a lot like a V value, but it takes in a state and an action. A Q value, Q star S A, is the expected utility if you start in state S and take action A, and from then onwards, act optimally. So A does not need to be the optimal action. A could be not optimal at all. For every combination of state and action, you can define your Q star, but it's defined as after you took that action A, you act optimally then onwards. So there's a Bellman equation for that too. Let's look at that equation. Looks very similar to the equation we already saw. It's now with Qs instead of Vs. Q star S A, well, first thing that happens in this scenario, you have to take action A which will lead to a distribution over next states, sum over S prime, next states S prime, probability of landing in S prime. You get a reward associated with that transition. And then there is what happens after that transition. You're in a new state S prime, and you're gonna act optimally from that state S prime. So what that means is that in that state S prime, you're gonna have optimal value, so Q star, but that optimal value also for the optimal action that you can take in that state. This actually here, Q star S prime A prime, that's the same as V star of S. It's the optimal value you can get in state S prime, that's V star of S. It's the same as the max overall actions, Q star S prime A prime. You can run Q value iteration just like regular value iteration. Exact same setup, you have a Q value with horizon of K. You can use that to compute the Q value for horizon K plus one. So QK plus one is, well, we know um, what happens. Actually, we should have stars here because it's gonna be the optimal Q values. Sum over S prime next states, probability of landing that state S prime, reward you get, and then gamma times max over actions, QK, so the Q value with K times steps to go in state S prime, taking the best action A prime in that state. You might wonder, we already have the V value iteration, why do we also want Q value iterations? A lot of reasons we'll see later. One reason you might already care about now, or that's simple to see now, if you run it this way, you actually don't need to keep track of a policy and a value function, because if you just compute the Q values, it encodes implicitly the optimal policy, because once you have Q star S A to act optimally, all you have to do is say, well, which of the actions achieves the highest value for Q star S A and take that action. So you're encoding both in Q uh, and that might be convenient. What does it look like pictorially? If we run Q value iteration on the same grid, 
we now will have four values per state because, well, there are four actions, except for the exit states where we only have one action available. And each, val each action will have a Q value associated with it. In this case, optimal Q value for horizon of 100, which actually is when it's converged, the same as horizon equal uh, infinity. Okay, so we've seen value iteration, and that forms the foundation of a lot of things we'll be doing. Now in the last few minutes we have for this lecture, another five or 10 minutes here, let's look at policy iteration, which will be a question about value iteration. Why do we need this? Um, maybe the way to put it is we're giving the lecture in a mathematical way. We're giving you a few tools and haven't exactly told you yet why you need this, but it's very easy to introduce the tool right now when we've already seen V's and there's such strong similarity. And so it's easy to see how Q and V relate to each other. And in the next lectures, we'll start using them and you'll see places where you need Q and V won't cut it. And then we won't have to kind of go all the way back to this to remind you of values so you can see it in context. Question there? We'll get to that. Um, but the first answer here is that actually you cannot solve a system of linear equations for this because this is a nonlinear equation. So the max there makes it nonlinear. But you're absolutely right. If there was no max there, this would be a linear equation because V star is the unknown, P is known, R is known. So short of the max, this would be a linear equation, but the max makes it nonlinear. And valuation happens to be a convenient way to solve this nonlinear equation. But if you had another way to solve the nonlinear equation, that's perfectly fine too. As long as you solve that equation, it has a unique solution, which is the optimal value function. Um, in practice, people don't tend to use other solution methods. Or if they use other solution, solution methods, they very directly build on the value iteration idea rather than just a generic nonlinear equation solver. I might keep going for a little bit and we'll get the questions at, at the end of lecture, see what are common questions, and then uh, maybe answer those a little later. Okay. Policy iteration. The first thing we need, and to your point, we don't know yet why we're going to need this, but bear with me, trust me. It, it's going to be good for you. Um, <laughs> we'll first revisit value iteration, because in that context, it's easy to understand policy evaluation. This is the value iteration equation. Keep that on the slide. What if now we want to do something else? We have a policy pi of s, so that for every state tells you what action to take. It doesn't need to be the optimal policy, just a policy saying for every state what action that policy prescribes. What if we want to compute something else? Not the optimal value function, v star, but the value you get in a state if you were to use the policy pi. Somebody gives you a policy and say, well, how good is that policy? Well, what's the value of that policy pi? How, we can compute, how can we compute the value of the policy pi? So we'll now compute v pi of s rather than v star of s. Look at the value iteration equation. Max over actions, and then what happens after the transition, averaged out. What if the policy is fixed? I want to know the value of a policy. What does that do? What it does, it gets rid, gets rid of the max. We don't get to choose the action at each, each time for each state. It's frozen to be pi of s. So if we want to compute the value of a policy pi, we can just replace the max by a, our action has to be pi of s. We have no choice. Do that, we'll get the same set of update equations as we had with value iteration, but now it'll compute the value of the policy pi rather than the value, optimal value function v star. Another way to think of it is that you're now in a different market decision process a new market decision process where in every state the action has been chosen for you, it's fixed, there's no choice. And in that MDP where the actions are fixed, the optimal value is the same as the value of that policy pi that freezes all your actions. And so you can use the exact same equation as your value for value iteration for policy evaluation um, by freezing the actions, yes. Not yet. I'll have a quiz for you where it's stochastic and you can try to solve that one. Coming up soon. Question, yes. 
That equation is linear, absolutely, and that's coming up in two slides. <laughs> it's great to be anticipating things, though. That means that you're following along really well. We'll have the same convergence guarantee. At convergence, this equation will hold true with equality. So instead of a left arrow, that should be an equality, and this will hold true with equality. Exercise you were asking about. If we had a stochastic policy, what do the value iteration equations look like to find the value of the policy? Let's take for this just 30 seconds, think about it, talk to your neighbor, and then see what we think. One, two, or three. We want to evaluate a stochastic policy as a distribution over actions given state. So pi A given S is going to be a probability of action A when you're in state S. How to do policy evaluation for this stochastic policy. Okay, 30 seconds for you to think and talk, and let's see what you find. Who, th who thinks number one? Raise of hands. Who thinks number two? Raise of hands. Who thinks number three? Raise of hands. I like people who are daring to raise their hands for three after the entire audience. <laughs> raise their hands for two. If you're right, that's a very high value proposition there. Um, okay, let's see. What do we got? Um, we're evaluating a policy. The policy is fixed. So we don't get the max over actions because it's going to be the distribution, pi A given S. We don't get to choose. So this is not going to work out, the first one. Um, third one, it's not going to work out either because we don't get to choose which state S prime we land in. We can't max over that in any way. In fact, the math doesn't even totally make sense potentially there. Well, the math works out, but it's just a very weird math. Um, <laughs> and you just don't get to choose your next state. So the middle one is left as the clearly the most meaningful one. Let's now check that it's indeed correct. So what is this doing? We want to know the value of a state s with k plus 1 steps to go. Well, the policy is fixed, so we'll, we'll get to choose an action based on the, not to even choose, action will be chosen for us with a probability a given s, sum over all actions, because they all could be having non-zero probability here. Then it's a sum over next states, s prime. So this together is the probability of an action and next state combination to happen, times reward you get for the transition, plus gamma times the value with one less time step to go. So the middle one is the correct one. Now we know how to evaluate policies. That assumes somebody gives us a policy and we can say, oh, I like your policy, I don't like your policy, that's fine. But what we really typically want to do is not just tell somebody whether we like their policy, but actually then improve upon it. So policy iteration does exactly that. The mental picture for policy iteration is that you evaluate a current policy, pi k, and then you try to improve on that policy by looking one step ahead, okay? So I'll break it down into more detail, but that's the high level picture. You start with a policy, whatever it is, and then you try to improve that policy. And a lot of the algorithms we'll see will have that kind of mode of operation. Um, so how do you evaluate a policy? We just saw that. We can just iterate the policy evaluation equations to get the value of a policy. We run the still convergence with the value of the policy. How do we improve? There could be many ways to improve. One way to do it, the typical policy iteration way to do it, is to look at this equation here. What is this saying? It's saying, I'm going to do a max again. And this is the policy evaluation equation. This is the same thing as we had over here. So this thing here is saying, if I, is evaluating if I took action A, some next state will happen as prime, and a distribution of our next states will happen. And as a consequence, I'll have some reward and some future value based on my policy pi k that I have at this point. Now, what I want to pick, I want to find a new policy, policy pi k plus 1, a better policy, hopefully. And how is it going to be better? I'm going to choose the action that if I choose that action and from then onwards use the policy pi k, I do the best among all choices of actions. So it's an interesting way of improving, saying like, yes, somebody gave me a policy, I'm, I'll be happy to use it in the future, but in the first step, I get to choose. And it turns out that if you then, that action you choose in your first step, and you do that for all states to see what it is that you would choose in the first step, you can basically define a new policy that tells you what to do in each state, 
And it turns out that that's a better policy than the policy we're given. That's not super intuitive per se, but it turns out that that's true, and that's a way to improve your policy. Um, you, and then you can repeat this global loop until this converges, and you, when you update your policy, you go from pi k to pi k plus one, turns out pi k plus one equals pi k. Okay? So computationally, um, there's two ways to do this. One way to do it is what we just described. You do policy evaluation by iterating these Bellman equations, and then you improve your policy. There's another way to do the policy evaluation because the max is dropped in policy evaluation. You can do policy evaluation by solving a system of linear equations, which was brought up already uh, twice hinted at, that once the max is gone, it's linear equations, and actually that's often how you could do it. You say, well, I'm gonna run policy iteration. What does that mean? I pick a policy, I do policy evaluation using one of those two methods, maybe solving just a linear system. Then I have a policy's, that policy's values. I can do an improvement to that policy's values with the equation, uh, to the policy with that equation at the bottom, and then I can evaluate that policy repeat. Okay, so here's the full thing. Let me now give you a little bit of intuition and theory behind this. Um, don't worry about the theory too much, but I want you to know it exists. This is guaranteed to converge, and at convergence, the current policy and its value function are the optimal policy and the optimal value function. What's the proof sketch? Um, why is it guaranteed to converge? One, in every step, the policy improves. I haven't told, given you a lot of evidence for that, but let's assume in every step the policy improves. What, do, what would that mean? If every step the policy improves, there's only a finite number of policies, at some point, you can't keep improving. Because, well, there's a finite number of policies, and if every step you improve, at some point you hit the limit of what you can do in terms of improving, or you stop earlier. But at some point, this process has to stop because there's a bound on how many times you can improve. So that guarantees convergence. doesn't guarantee convergence to the optimal thing. It guarantees convergence. Okay. Why is this optimal at convergence? If the policy does not change, at convergence, the policy does not change. What does that mean? If you look at this equation here, it means that the max, if you take the max, that's the same as what the policy already prescribed. If the policy is doing the max, then it means that this evaluation equation is actually the Bellman equation because the policy is implicitly doing the max already, and so you have the optimal values living in there. Don't worry about this too much. This is just a little extra, um, just to then make sure that you know the theory exists. The one thing I didn't say much about is why in every step the policy improves. The way to think of that is as follows. Why does the policy improve in every step? If you just change your first action and then onwards use the old policy, you definitely improve on the old policy because, well, that's how you chose the action. You said the best action, assuming I use the old policy from then onwards, that best action is the best and could be better than what the policy would prescribe. So you're better than the old policy by this time-varying policy where the first time you do something special and then you use the old policy. Okay, so now we know, we know how to do better than the old policy. We take that first time step. After we've taken it, we could follow the old policy or we could just repeat the thought process we just went through. We could say we're in a new state. We could use the old policy or we could do the same thing. Say we're in a new state. Let's take the best action in this state, assuming then onwards we use the old policy. And if we do that again, again, we're doing better than just using the old policy. Repeat, repeat, repeat. And that is what it means to use this new policy. So the new policy is better than the old policy. Again, don't worry about it too much about the theory. I want to include it for people who have maybe already more background. But I don't want you to worry if the theory is, isn't fully clear. Yes? If we have infinite action space, the, the iteration over action is going to be tricky, and we'll get to that. Absolutely right. So the exact methods will barely ever work. There are, there's one exception, which we'll also see tomorrow. But in general, we'll need something else. And so we're building up from the simple case, and we'll build out from there on how to solve a more complex scenario like the one you're thinking about. I'm going to wrap up this lecture, because I want to make sure we have enough time for the next lectures. Um, 
And what I'd like to do is, um, after we wrap up this lecture, have you post questions on Piazza. Rohan will look at the questions being asked there, filter through them, we'll try to answer them there. But then also, if a question is frequently recurring or a lot of people have unclarity about something, we'll also cover it in person um, from the stage. So, what we saw is exact methods to solve small MDPs. Just to build intuition and have a mathematical starting point to later solve more complex MDPs. Um, what are the limitations? We need to iterate over and store, have storage for all states and all actions. So we need small MDPs, otherwise not going to work. And to do this, we actually need access to a dynamics model. If we don't know P S prime given S comma A, then we don't know how to do this because that P S prime given S A, the dynamics of the world is in those equations. And we rely on knowing that to do this. And so in the next lecture, Rocky Dwan will start diving into how to circumvent some of those assumptions. Um, but that's it for me for now. Thank you. <laughs>